Dear God, I just want to thank you for waking us up today, Lord, and starting each and every one of us on our way, God. I thank you for allowing us to make it to another annual conference year, God. We have experienced so much loss within this year, the past two years, God, whether loss of jobs, a loved one, loss in our health, God. I just thank you for sustaining us through all of this, God, and blessing us and comforting us when needed, Lord. I thank you, God, in advance for restoration of all that we have lost, God. I ask, Lord, that you would bring healing that is needed. I ask, Lord, that you would bless our bishop and supervisor, God, our presiding elders, our pastors, their churches, and all of the members. I ask, God, that you would continue to bless the lay organization, God, that you would bless us with unity and strength and guidance to continue on doing your will and your way, God. Finally, Lord, I ask that you would bless this important conversation on preserving Black families all over, God, that this conversation would turn into action. I thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I will be reading the scripture as well, and it will be coming from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 19, the King James Version. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 19, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, which maketh the way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together and they shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth and she yea not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you so much. Sister Kyra. Kyra, did I get it right? It's Kara. Kyra, okay. Kara. <laughs> Kyra, okay. Thank you so much, sister. It was beautiful devotion. Um, before I introduce the presenters, we have a special group of welcome. We have some special welcomes. And uh, we want to uh, start with our awesome presiding elder, Alan Williams from the great LA North District. So it's all yours, Zoom manager. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Good afternoon. What a wonderful time we have had all day to Bishop Clement W. Few and Episcopal Supervisor Alexia Butler Few, to Fifth District President Brother Lamar Rose, to our president, Sister Linda Smith, and all the lay uh, officers on behalf of the LA North District, we want to take a moment and congratulate you on this, your annual lay day at the annual conference. Uh, we're praying God's blessings upon the work, the videos, the panel <clears throat> discussion today, and especially your big, hairy, audacious goals. We pray you have a fantastic time. Honored to be sharing with you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Presiding Elder. And you have been such a great supporter that I want you to know that we are totally and always appreciate it and are humbled to have your support. First, uh, giving honor to God. Uh, it's good to be with you uh, to this evening on your annual full lay event. Uh, I bring greetings uh, from the Los Angeles South, Las Vegas district. And we, uh, as a district, we're here to support and we wish and pray for your success this evening. It is my pleasure uh, uh, to introduce to some and to present to others the 131st elected and consecrated bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the presiding prelate of the 5th Episcopal District, Bishop Clement W. Few. 
Good evening, hello everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to, to greet you on this year late convention uh, to welcome the president, for the, <clears throat> excuse me, the fifth district president as a part of our conversation and to thank the presiding elders of the North and the South districts for your support of the organization. As I look at the grid, it's good to welcome presidents from other conferences who have come to support uh, President Smith in this endeavor this afternoon. Let me just say that the bar has been set very high during this series of conferences about what happens in the late conventions uh, on these third Wednesday afternoons. Um, we have uh, looked at social justice issues. We have um, looked at um, diversity issues. And we had a high schooler to tell us just a couple of days ago that matters of, of inclusivity are more than just black and white, but now they run the whole spectrum of the rainbow. And we need to be aware that uh, as we embrace each other uh, fully as a part of, of God's family. So tonight when I saw that the president and committee had selected as your theme, um, preserving the black family, and then to select persons who are uh, very versed in this conversation, I commend you, uh, President uh, Smith, for uh, your leadership in this regard. And I commend those persons who've taken the time just to listen. Uh, again, if this is to follow suit with what has happened in a series of conferences, this should be time well spent. Thank you for a chance to share this with you and look forward to uh, what lies ahead. Have a great convention. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Few, and much love and appreciation you taking the time because I know you got lots of work to do and very, very important things to take care of in pre preparation for the annual conference tomorrow morning. So thank you with love and send my love to supervisor as well. Okay, so um, what we will do now, I will be introducing our uh, speakers, but before I do that, I um, want you to know that this is a conversation and a dialogue. And after the third speaker, we will have a Q and I or a question and answer period. So feel free during the presentations to begin to put your questions or even your comments in the chat room and to address them to one of the speakers or to all three of them, if you want all three of them to comment. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our first program presenter, Sister Patricia W. Bevelin, who retired as a child welfare service manager with the San Diego County and after 23 years. She has a total of 33 years working in the foster care system. She is an active member of Bethel AME Church in San Diego, serving in numerous lay leadership positions. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to turn this program over to Sister Patricia. Okay, I'm unmuted and I wish to thank uh, Ms. Linda Smith for this opportunity to talk about something that is extraordinarily near and dear to my heart. And I'm very passionate about it. And that is institutionalized racism and child welfare services leading to disproportionality. So once you know about it, you can't ignore it and you shouldn't ignore it. I've worked in social services for over 40 years. 23 of those years was with child welfare services. I have been retired for over 10 years. And I'd say that as a point of reference so that you can understand that this is, a, this is an issue that's been going on for over 50 years. Andrew Billingsley, who is considered the father of black social work, wrote about the unfair treatment of blacks in the then CPS in 1988. So I want you to establish a timeline about the unfairness that is 
they are unfair as institutional rights institutionalized racism that African-American families are experiencing in the child welfare system. I tell you, to be honest with you, it's a blessing that we have a family at all. We have so many institutions that are disproportionately, uh, uh, have a disproportionate number of African-American uh, children or adults in the system. I wanna say up front that I am talking about the child welfare services system. So in my I experience, I have met some what kind of work you do on your bishop? Awesome foster parents. But the reality prevention has to be the key. <laughs> okay, am I back on? Am I okay to go, Linda? Yes, yes you're back on. Okay. I keep seeing these different images coming up. So the reality of the situation for over, for over 50 years, Blacks are more likely to be reported to child welfare services. So, you know, walking while Black, driving while Black, sitting in your couch, eating ice cream while Black, going to school while Black. Child welfare services is no difference. Now, this means that Blacks are more likely to be investigated and more likely to have petitions filed. But given the same risk factors, Blacks are more likely to have children removed from their home and are least likely to reunify. In all honesty, this is not a California phenomenon. Rather, it is a national disgrace. So the title of my uh, presentation, if I can get the cover slide, If I can get that PowerPoint up. So Linda, is the PowerPoint up? There, thank you. The title of my presentation is, is What About the Children? Impact of Disproportionality in CWS on African-American Children and Families. And the reason why I entitled What About the Children is because in an African uh, village, when a stranger would come, they would ask the elders, how are the children doing? Because they knew if the children were doing well, then the village was doing well. Okay, let's move over to some facts. Next slide, please. There are approximately 424,000 foster youth nationwide. The medium age, of children in foster care is six and a half years old. 20,000 youth age out of foster care every year. And those are youth between the ages of 18 and 21. The foster care system underinvests in foster children, contributing less than 50% of what it will cost an average American family to raise a child from the age of zero to 17. And within four years of aging out, 50% have low earnings and those that do make an average income of $7,500. Next slide, please. So what is disproportionality? Disproportionality is defined as a marked difference in size, number, or amount of something as compared to another. Some of the underlying causes are a disproportionate and disparate need of children of diverse racial and ethnic background, particularly due to the high rate of poverty. Racial bias and discrimination exhibited by individuals, including caseworkers, mandated reporters, child welfare system factors, the lack of resources for families of diverse racial and ethnic background, and caseworkers' characteristics. Geographic context, such as the region, state, or our neighborhood. Do your children, do black children live in a neighborhood that are considered to be bad neighborhoods? Policies and legislation, a lack of measures targeting the needs of children of diverse racial and ethnic background. 
and then structural racism, historical policies and cultural dynamics. Uh, last month, I believe it was, the Supreme Court refused to change the laws regarding individuals who are arrested with crack cocaine. But yet and still, you look at the fentanyl and the oxycodone crisis that exists in this country, and they are viewed as individuals who need treatment, whereas African-Americans uh, were viewed and continue to be viewed as criminals. So let's take a look at the face of foster care, please. Next slide. In 2018, Black children represented 14% of the total child population, but 23% of all children in foster care. But by comparison, white kids represented 50% of the nation's child population and only 44% of the children in foster care. Latinos and Hispanic children represented 25% of kids nationwide, yet just 21% of all kids in foster care. Asians and native Hawaiian kids made up 5% of the US child population, but only 1% of the foster care population. So in other words, those three groups are underrepresented in foster care compared to the total number of children in the population, while African-American children continues to be overrepresented. Why is that important that we understand that we are overrepresented and what does that mean to the future of our children and our families? Next slide, please. Thank you. It is important because of the adverse outcome that children who have been exposed to the foster care system experience. Listen to this, 80% of inmates incarcerated in our prisons have spent time in foster care. 40 to 50% of former foster youth become homeless after 18 months after leaving, within 18 months after leaving care. 60% of youth earn income below the poverty line 65% of children in foster care experience seven or more school changes from elementary to high school. And on an average, they experience at least eight changes of placements. Black children are almost twice as likely to be placed in foster care than white kids. Because black kids are already targeted at a disproportionate rate of school discipline and criminalization, being a foster youth compounds this fact. Foster youth, particularly girls, are targeted by sex traffickers. And the criminalization of sex work can follow these young ladies who are victims of modern day slavery into the criminal justice system. Foster youth are more likely to recycle back into the foster care system with their own children. And Black families have a lower reunification rate and are more likely to age out of the system. With those results, can we really say that foster care is a good parent? I don't think so. We all know the problem. We've all experienced it in our community. So let's focus on solutions. Number one, start a group, but get your facts first. What does disproportionality look like? What does it look like in your county? I was going to give a breakdown by county, but I only have 15 minutes. So I chose the biggest monster of them all, LA County. African-American youth are far more overrepresented as the far most overrepresented racial group in LA County. While black youth make up a little more than 7%, of the countless child population, they account for more than 24% of the youth receiving services by the Department of Child and Family Services, 24%. And that is from the department. White and Asian youth are underrepresented in the system compared to the overall child population. And 60% of LA youth are Hispanic, but they're not disproportionately represented in child welfare services 
because their population rep in Carroll is the same percentage of their population, period. So get involved. Please get involved. Learn about resources in your county and community group that addresses disproportionality. Make your group known to the power that be. Do you know the name of your DFCS, DCFS uh, administrators? Do you know who's over them? Identify resources that need to strengthen your families. Is it domestic violence? Is it drug, drug treatment? Are those services within a reasonable distance for your families so that they do not have to come into the, into the system, that they can ask to find resources that help keep them out and help them to overcome their challenges? Learn about mandated reporting. And whose home are foster of African-American children being placed? In San Diego, many African-American children are placed in non-English speaking homes. So you think about a child that comes through the system, that's the first trauma, going, getting in a car with a stranger, going they don't know where, that's the second trauma. And then being placed in a home where no one's, where they don't speak English, that's the third trauma. But also think about a mom who is trying to reunify with her children, but she cannot communicate with the caregiver. So where are your children being placed? Are there sufficient uh, African-American foster parents or African-American willing to take on the role of being a foster parent? Demand programs specifically designed to address disproportionality. The Cultural Broker Program was designed that people who look like African-Americans will be helped by people who are African-American. It is a very big deal and a huge challenge to navigate the child welfare system, especially once you get to the point that the court is involved. Family finders, there are families always who have at least one person who's willing to take on the child so that the child does not only, uh, this child does not have to leave the community and the child does not, and stay, the child can stay within the family. But is Child Welfare Services doing a good job in that? In my experience, the answer is no. And then ask for additional oversight of every African-American child that's moved. Remember I said earlier that given the same risk factor, African-American child is more likely to be removed additional oversight from not the social worker, not the supervisor, but at a manager level has been shown to reduce the number of children that come into the system. Coordinate service with other county programs. What about mental health? You know, we, as a, as a group, we need to move away from the word crazy and understand that mental illness is a need for services and services that are culturally appropriate and services that will address our underlying needs of our, not only us, but the community as well. Contract procurement. I did a study for the contracts in San Diego County. Very little money was coming into our community. A lot of money was going up north to the more affluent community. And welfare to work. Make sure welfare to work is actually working. It's not just with some contractor who has a job, but isn't reducing the number of people who or on welfare, and, and in addition to that, that they are training them to get a job, get a better job. Improve family support services. Are the services that your families need to survive located in your area, or do they have to catch two and three buses to go to those services? Are they culturally appropriate? Do service providers look like the clients that they are serving? Expand community involvement. Next slide. Okay, expand community involvement. Develop the, a community-led approach to addressing disproportionality. Do it in your church, your civic groups, your sororities. Get involved. And if you get involved, I can guarantee you, you will make a difference. Let's talk about mandatory training. Right now, in many counties, it is not training relative to the critical race theory, Cultural competency, cultural awareness is not mandatory. So the people who end up going to the train are the ones who really don't need it and the ones who really need it aren't going. Make it mandatory. Advocate for changes in mandated reporting. The African American community is over police. So why don't we change the process of mandated reporting 
to having families refer to in-home services to meet their family when they are in crisis. Develop citizen review committee. Take a look at uh, contacting your county and there is a pushback on this from the Child Welfare Service Institution, but work to develop a citizen review committee. And that way Child Welfare Service can begin being transformed from a family of, uh, from a, a organization that separates family to a family well-being system that prioritizes strengthening families, which is what we all want to see happen, our families strengthen. Not looking at deficits, but looking at our strength. And last but not least, prevention, prevention, prevention. Keep our families out of these systems. Uh, find programs, develop programs, demand programs that address poverty, health care, child care, transportation, housing, juvenile leadership program. We have the ability to make a difference. So let's make a difference. I'm going to end with this. Now, the, the uh, solutions as well as the problem that I gave are some, but not necessarily all. But let me close with this. Colin, uh, Colin Kaepernick was not the first person to take a knee. The first person to take a knee was Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. They were the first person to take a knee, but they got up with determination and a commitment to improve the lives of black Americans. We can do no less. And to borrow from President Obama campaign slogan, Yes, we can. Yes, we can eliminate disproportionality in a child welfare services. And yes, we can strengthen our families. And yes, our family can take care of their children with each one of us taking a role and doing our part with our help and commitment to success. I thank you for the opportunity I tried to jam a lot in in that 15 minutes, and I will be around for questions. Again, thank you. Thank you, Sister Patricia. You have given us the facts. It's sobering, it's stunning, and we appreciate you doing this because we cannot ignore this. No. But we must do something about it, and we can. Yes, so, we can. Yes, we can. So get your questions and your comments ready. You can start putting them in the chat room or writing them down and have them ready for when we get to Q&A. But let's move on to our second presenter, uh, Sister Jackie Broxton, Executive Director of the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation of Fame Los Angeles. Under her leadership, the, the foundation was actually founded in 2013 and provides services and support to current and former foster youth in Los Angeles County. She is a 40-year member of FIRST Los Angeles and also served in a variety of positions. So, so her and our next two present, our next presenter are going to give you some ministries that are in work, examples of ministries and work to deal with this. So with this, I turn this over to you, Sister Jackie. Unmute. Unmute. Okay. There you go. Nothing like being prepared. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this time with me this evening. I want to tell you a little bit about the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation. Uh, can I thank you? But before I get into what we actually do, there's no way you can understand what we do if you don't understand a little bit about Biddy Mason, because that is our inspiration. Biddy Mason was an African American slave that was born in Hancock County, Georgia on August 15, 1818. She spent most of her early life from what we can tell on one plantation. She was separated from her parents as a lot of slaves were at a very early age. But somehow she learned the art of midwifery as well as herbal healing, which made her extremely valuable as a slave. 
she was purchased somewhere between 1842 and 1844 by Robert Smith and his wife. Now, many of us who have studied Biddy Mason's life have been told that she was given to the Smiths as a wedding present. That we know now is not true. They had actually been married for 10 years before she came into the household. The Smith family became Mormons and migrated to Salt Lake City uh, in 1847. They were in Salt Lake City for several years. Now, Biddy and her two children, she had two girls at the time, they walked from Mississippi to Salt Lake City along with 13 other slaves. After being in Salt Lake City for several years, the slave owner decided that he wanted to go to San Bernardino. The Mormons had a large agricultural settlement in San Bernardino. I don't know if Mr. Smith was aware of the fact that when he arrived in 1851, California had been admitted to the Union as a free state in 1850, but nevertheless, here this man comes with 13 slaves. There were slaves in Los Angeles, but most people only had one or two, not 13. So he stood out and got the attention of the local black community. After several years being here, uh, Biddy petitioned the court and in 1856, she was given her freedom. The very next day, she went to work as a midwife for Dr. John Griffith, making $2.50 a day. At the end of 10 years, she'd saved enough money to purchase her first piece of property at first in spring. And that set her on a trajectory of real estate investment. She was, by the time she passed away, her estate in today's money would be worth about $9 million. She learned the art of commercial real estate flipping. In 1872, she and eight other men who were all former slaves founded First AME Church in the living room of her home. But she never forgot her roots and she was a noted philanthropist. She took in people who were sick. She started an orphanage and she also started a school. And this is the reason why we decided to name the foundation after her because we wanted to embody her spirit and also preserve her legacy. So in 2013, the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation was born. It was an effort of members of First AME Church as well as community members. For many years, I, like the previous uh, speaker, had worked in the child welfare system. I was on the opposite side of the fence, though I was a fundraiser. So I knew from talking to kids over the years, I felt the frustration and the disappointments that so many of them had, particularly the African American children. And I got very annoyed with kids coming to me asking me questions like, who was Tom Bradley? Why is he important? Why is his name at the airport? And I realized these kids were not getting anything that even remotely resembled any instruction on their ethnicity. So when we formed the foundation, we wanted to have an emphasis on black art, black history, as well as resilience. Los Angeles County, as noted by the previous speaker, has the largest foster care population in the nation. There are 30,000 kids in the system. 24% of them, or 7,959, are African-American. How many YPDers do you think you could get out of that 7,000 kids? That's where we're losing our people, is it with our youth. African-American children growing up in the foster care system, as I said, have no real exposure to their racial identity, particularly when they're being raised in homes of people that do not look like them. So our intent was always to enforce the ethnicity and the positive sides of being black because they get enough of the other. So what we do primarily is we give academic and vocational scholarships. Over the years, because of the events that we have designed and hosted for foster youth, we have heard what they feel is important. And those who have successfully navigated the foster care system cite two things as being important, access to higher education and considering mentoring and a support system. Since 2018, we have awarded just under $300,000 in scholarships, and we have impacted the lives of over 300 youth. The acquisition last year of our new 4,000 square foot home now makes it possible 
for us to provide the badly needed mentoring and support services component for the success of these talented young people. Can I have the next slide, please? Guided by our mission statement, this, this slide that you're seeing now is uh, the resolution's not great, but this is actually a reproduction of a mural that hangs at the University of San Francisco that depicts Biddy Mason. It's one of 10 murals entitled The History of Medicine in California. And when we discovered that this mu these murals were in danger of being destroyed, each mural weighs about 2,500 pounds. And when we discovered that they were in danger of being destroyed, I co-wrote an op-ed piece for the LA Times that started somewhat of a firestorm in San Francisco. So we actually had a meeting with the chancellor the head of the real estate division and the PR division because they disputed as to whether or not this was actually Biddy Mason in the mural. And I had to actually give them a book list of books that actually show the mural and identify Biddy Mason as being in it. So as a result, we were given a high resolution of the image and it hangs in the lobby of our new facility. Next slide. This is the hallway in our facility. Uh, on one side, on your right side is the history of First AME Church and on your left side is Black Art. Uh, the, the acquisition of this home was the result of a collaboration between the Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation and the California Lutheran Home Foundation. They actually purchased the home for us and we paid them $10 a month rent. Uh, the house is free and clear the paper things that you paper pieces of paper that you see hanging from the, uh, each image actually is a description of the art and a bio of the artists. Uh, eventually those will be replaced with regular museum type plaques, but we're waiting until all the artwork is up so we can do it all at one time because we'll get a better price. Next slide. This is the dining room area of the home, which is a multi-purpose room on the wall that you cannot see. We have a 54 inch flat screen TV that was a gift to us by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, who has been very uh, supportive of our e efforts to get this house in order. Next slide. And this is our kitchen. We're gonna be actually be able to teach these young people how to prepare good, healthy meals because uh, many, many of them grow up eating top ramen and fast food. And I think that might be the last slide. Um, there, in addition to what you've seen here, there is a two bedroom apartment. This is actually a duplex. There's a two bedroom apartment where we, we will be housing four college females who are either going to vocational school or um, higher ed. So what do we, where do we go from here? What do we wanna do now? We want to provide services for kin gap families. These are uh, grandparents and relatives that are caring for foster youth that are often not paid at the same rate. They don't receive some of the same services. We also want to establish a legal clinic to help some of these kids. You know, We all know kids do things that sometimes are not very logical, like not paying traffic tickets and then they go into warrants. We have a team of attorneys who are ready to provide support in that area. And we also want to provide well care because most of these kids do not have a good sense of how best to take care of their own bodies. So that's where um, we are. No, this home is in Los Angeles. It's about five minutes from First AME Church. I'm, uh, I will be around to answer questions afterwards. afterwards. And thank you very much for sharing this time with me. Uh, thank you so much, um, Sister Jackie. Broxton and we are missionary sisters and we're part of the Biddy Mason unit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next, our next and our third and final presenter um, is Sister Tuesday English, a former foster youth from South Los Angeles. She is currently the Southern California Regional Manager with the Global Offering, offering Oh, oh, I'm pronouncing it wrong, excuse me, offering project, also known as Care Portal. So with that, I introduce to you Sister Tuesday English, who has been a benefit of 
Jackie Brock since uh, Biddy Mason Charitable Foundation Program. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you, AME Lay Organization, for allowing me to present. And yes, I am a beneficiary of the Biddy Mason, and I am excited to hear the further um, programs that you guys are hoping to create. I definitely would like to get in contact with you, Miss uh, Jackie, to see how Care Portal can further assist. Um, so I will just give a slight brief introduction of Care Portal because there will be a video played of how the platform works. Um, but I just want to be sure to iterate that Care Portal and my team are very much so aware of the disproportionality. Um, me being a former foster youth, I've seen it and I've experienced it. And all the statistics and the facts that you have heard today are all accurate, very much so true. Um, Care Portal uh, just seeks pretty much to help create a network of churches, African-American churches to be specific, to be able to be the hands and feet of Christ and actually intervene and come into the, the, um, the, the help of the kinship parents, so the grandparents, as well as the mothers who may be struggling, um, as well as fathers. So with no further ado, I will await for the presentation video to be shown. Thank you, AME, for inviting Care Portal to your conference and greetings to the other speakers who are here today. For those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Tuesday English, and I am a Southern California Regional Manager for Care Portal. At Care Portal, we understand the history and the legacy of AME Church, and we honor you and thank you for viewing Care Portal as a tool that enhances the occupancy of the African American community. We are looking forward to potentially working together. Care Portal. So, what is Care Portal? Care Portal is a technology platform that gives local churches the opportunity to become an agency within their community while partnering with local child serving agencies to support and sustain families. It accomplishes this by connecting churches to philanthropists, businesses, and families. Care Portal's goal is to give local churches self-sustainability, data, residency in their community, and visibility across the country. Care Portal understands that the church is the local problem-solving experts in the community, and we desire to support the church in receiving recognition and position, not only in the community they serve, but also in city council. At Care Portal, we wish to not be seen as the savior with an initiative to tell the church what to do. We want to assist in removing the isolation of the African-American church and the dehumanizing approaches that happens to the African-American churches when it comes to creating reciprocity. Therefore, we seek to connect churches to families that are in jeopardy of losing their children in the foster care system due to poverty or isolation. So to give you a better understanding of what the experience is like to be African-American and placed into foster care, I will give you a brief demonstration of the system. And so the system. So for a youth to go into care, there first must be a report made. And when the report is made, it is given to an agency and the agency then investigates the family. When they investigate, they are seeking to either preserve the family or to prevent the family from continuing abuse or neglect. Now, most families can remain intact through community support and agency assistance but sometimes children are removed for safety reasons. 
And as a result of this, the children goes into foster care. Again, most children are returned to their parents or extended family members, but some parents have their parental rights terminated. And what this means is a parent signs a paper, a document that states that they can no longer care for their child and that they need the state to now care for their child. Now, currently, unfortunately, in the African-American community, there are much higher rates of African-American parents signing the termination of rights for being parents of their children at higher rates uh, compared to their white and Hispanic counterparts. What this means then that there is double the rate of foster youth who are within foster care are of African-American descent. Therefore, as a result of that, they are placed then in, into the position of being adopted. Now, most children do get adopted, uh, but unfortunately, currently in the African-American uh, populations in foster care, you will find that in percentage, African-American youth are less likely to be adopted out of foster care, meaning that you're likely to find children and teens in foster care who were never adopted or reunited with their family. And as a result of this, they go into what is called a transitioning age youth. So transition is when a child or when a teenager becomes 18 and they are no longer now um, liable to be a ward of court, as in the state is no longer the parent of the child or the teen. And so as a result of this, they transition out of foster care and they are likely to become incarcerated, homeless, trafficked or become teen parents. Statistically, unfortunately, African-American girls are amongst the highest rates of victims who are found to be sex trafficked. And as a result of these results, what will likely happen is you will find that the transitioning aid youth will then have a child. And as a result, that child is more likely to enter into foster care and then a report is made, and then the agency investigates. And so then this continues the cycle of the African-American youth going into the foster care system. So Care Portal seeks to stop this. It seeks to stop and prevent the high rates of African-American youth going into foster care by ways of poverty or the lack of having a community around them to recognize them, to see them within the isolations that they live within. So to give you an idea of how Care Portal works and what it means to become a church connected to Care Portal, I will show you a video of a first lady named Erica Glenn and her experience of becoming a connecting church through Care Portal. To you, our pastors and church leaders, we value you. Our children and families need you now more than ever. We know the bad news about family breakdown. We are losing children of color to systems. 14% of children in this nation are black, yet 23% of children in the foster system are black. And the foster system can be a gateway to ongoing problems. 50% of the homeless, 60% of girls rescued from sex trafficking, and 75% of those incarcerated all spend time in the foster system. And you fight the unseen battle every day to keep kids and families out of the foster system. Very few truly understand the power of your ministry. I understand. I'm the first lady and pastor of a small community church in a low income area. For my husband and me, fighting for kids and families off the grid has defined our life's journey. Now we've lived the bad news. But there is some good news. God is changing things. God is stirring you, local churches, with the heart to meet needs near you. He is stirring others with resources to fund those needs. And he is raising up a community committed to reversing the foster crisis in our nation. Now, what we need is a connection. And now we have it. It's called Care Portal. And here's how it works. Caseworkers with child-serving agencies encounter needs of children in crisis every day. 
They enter vetted needs in the care portal, which immediately makes local churches and community members who join the network aware, giving them a real-time opportunity to respond. So whether it's one church that responds or a community of churches and businesses and individuals working together, Care Portal makes vital connections possible through an easy-to-use platform at your fingertips. How will this work for you? You already have the most important resources, the heart, the church family, and the trust of the community. Care Portal will add two new weapons to your arsenal. When a caseworker has a family about to break, that need goes into Care Portal, and it will come right here to you. Others in the community are blessed with financial resources, and they get the same need. But when someone says yes to fund that need, those funds get transferred right here to this Care Portal Reloadable Debit Card. It's in your hands, and you use the resources to do what you are anointed to do. Connect with the family. Meet the need. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in your neighborhood. You become a leading church, a connecting church. I'm here because Care Portal is empowering so many churches, including my own. For many years, I've heard the word empowerment used in partnerships. But when it came down to meeting needs, our church was often left feeling diminished and not empowered. Care Portal has changed that. It's a transformational ministry tool in our church, and we have so many new relationships from care connections, healthy relationships, and we're hearing the same testimony from many other churches, just like ours, just like yours. At a time of earthly division in our country, a new wind is blowing. It's one of kingdom unity. And once again, a child will lead us. So pray about becoming a connected church. And so, as you have seen, Care Portal seeks to stop the high rates and the plight of African American youth going into. Not that you're care. counting, but you. And so in order to, to show you just a few of the items that are normally um, requested in order to help prevent the youth from going into foster care, I will show you a brief chart of some of the items that are typically requested. And so typically what is requested and asked in order to help families are items like beds, cribs, couches, strollers, diapers and formula. Items that in some families, this is normal, but unfortunately due to higher rates of poverty within the African American community, these items can determine if a child is placed into foster care or if they stay home. So to also give you an idea of what this platform looks like in real time, I will show you our map. So here on the map you see United States, but to give you a look at a more detailed version of what it looks like to be a church on the care portal, here you see orange and red dots. So in the areas where you see orange dots, those are churches that are activated, who are part of Care Portal. And then the red circles, the red dots, you see these are families that are in need for churches to step in and help prevent family separation. So just to show you what it looks like in close real time, I will give you a brief Look at Los Angeles. Wow, look at these churches. So here in Los Angeles, you see a plethora of the orange, which is churches. And then the reds, you see families that are in need. So if you were to look a wee bit closer, you will see churches and families that are within close proximities of each other. So here you see a church 
here. And within the proximity of the Crenshaw Christian Center, there are two families here and more families here. And so as you see, as the map becomes closer, you can see, wow, there's occupancy here of the churches within the community here, but there's also need for more churches. And so this is where we say, what uh, uh, an impact this can be within our communities. If there's a church on every other corner, could you imagine the amount of families that can receive help by them becoming a connecting church? So that is my brief introduction of Care Portal and how it works. If you have any further questions, you can email me at Tuesday at careportal. Org. Thank you so much for giving me this time to explain to you what Care Portal is doing within the African American community and how the church can be involved and create agency within the community. You have a great rest of your day and I'll see you soon. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Tuesday. And uh, thanks to all three of our presenters. Uh, we want to go into a dialogue or some feedback and kind of want to hear from you uh, on what you've heard today. Now, um, depending on our 5th District IT team to uh, go through into the chat room, um, go through and start to read those questions and address them to questions to whom um the person is addressed it to or they may say they want all of the presenters to address that question so are we ready to get started with the question and ask answer period yes uh, one person says that the data that they're showing is alarming and we need to take some action. Uh, another person says, um, our Black community is losing the stopgap resources of great, our, our grandparents as uh, parental saviors of raising our children. So someone else uh, says that. Linda, could I just comment on that, um, yeah. grandparents? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Maybe the three of you might want to comment on both of those statements. One of the uh, initiatives that we're working on finalizing right now is support for KinGap uh, parents, because a lot of these grandparents, they're not, um, and I'm a grandparent, and I'm not IT savvy on everything, so, and, and they're having some serious challenges with these kids and the cell phones and the computers and all of that. And we want to be able to do classes for the grandparents to make them more comfortable with technology so they really understand what these kids are getting themselves into. Also, there's this prevailing problem of poverty. Uh, if you are on a fixed income and you've got a 16 or 17 year old boy that's eating you out of house and home, you need help. And we want to be in a position to provide some of those support services to them and to also give the, uh, I mean, once you've raised children to have to go back and start all over again, that's a whole, that requires a whole different mindset. So we wanna provide uh, more services to these families. And we have some kin gap parents that are working with us on this, uh, but this is very important because many of us have these people in our congregations and they really need support. They need a tremendous amount of support. Um, I'm not I'll a panelist, but I, I just wanted to say, uh, times have changed. She's right. Uh, the person who wrote about the gra grandparents, uh, traditionally, uh, for the most part, I was raised by a grandma. But I think Pat Bevelin can uh, testify to the fact that sometimes we've had people in our shelter, who are a second and third generation homeless because, uh, in the foster care system. So it it's not just the kids that are there now, their parents and grandparents. 
as as the statistics showed, have been in the foster care system. So we can't depend on grandparents in a lot of instances the way that we used to. Uh, I hope that the question that Berta Bradley, I think I saw it under there, gets answered, answered by Tuesday uh, in terms of how, give us more information about how the church can get involved, the in-depth information that you gave us when you uh, talked with the committee. Um, before Tuesday answers that, I understand that we have uh, folks uh, raising their hands instead of putting their question in the chat room. Okay. And maybe uh, uh, Reverend Benjamin Thomas can see that because I can't. But I understand, yes, that um, Francis Settle and uh, Verda Bradley uh, definitely have some questions. They're panelists, so maybe you can have them ask their own question. Uh, before we get to them, uh, we have two questions in the chat, uh, both for Tuesday. It says, how uh, many other churches are involved in Care Portal? And then the second question is, how does a church support your activities? Great. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, to help, to piggyback off of what Ms. Jackie was saying before I approach those two questions, is um, it is greatly needed. I, as it was said, I am a former foster youth, but my grandmother took us, took me and all six of my siblings in and she became a kin gap um, uh, caretaker. So I did see that this is something that happens a lot within the African-American community. Um, African-American women uh, do not spend longer time in prisons and in jails. And so you do tend to find the newer generations where the grandmothers are <laughs> the the barrets of everything and they do need that support and um as well as what miss uh dorothy was saying that grandparents cannot sustain as well as they did back in the 50s and 60s so um this is greatly needed and i look forward to speaking to miss jackie again i'm excited about baby mason the baby mason foundation because you're touching on everything that i seen as being not only a representative with um care portal but i've also done advocacy in washington dc and working with sex traffic teens. So I have definitely seen the dynamics and what you're doing is great. So to help answer that question, currently on our platform, we have um, in LA County, uh, 70 churches that has uh, signed up as of 2021. Um, in total, I believe our total now uh, across uh, America, I can't tell you for all of California, but across America, um, I know we have, um, I think, I believe it's like up to 23,000 churches. Um, now, these are churches that are of all different type of uh, denominations, as well as uh, racial backgrounds. So we have some churches, let's say, that are in Minnesota that are predominantly Asian um, population, yet they could see a need inside of South Central somewhere with a predominantly African-American church. And we'll send funds directly to that church through the care portal card to help fund a need within the community. And so um, as far as, as, far the, total as the total, total life, I can't give you the, the full, um, but I do know there's over 23,000 churches that's currently on our platform, but there are 70 churches within the southern part of California. Um, the other question I believe was how uh, can churches become involved? Um, was that correct? I just want to make sure I got that question. Yes. Okay, yes, yeah. so um, one way is enrolling. Um, the website is careportal.org. Uh, there's a tab there that says get involved. If you click that tab, uh, it will be another tab that says church leaders. Click that, it'll just take you sh completely through. Or if you need a little more help and assistance, you can email me at tuesday at careportal.org. Uh, um, but just to kind of give you an idea of how the process works, is it's completely free. We get asked this all the time is how can churches collect so much money on this platform and uh, be able to help families and how much? It's totally free. Um, and the funds that you use through the Care Portal card designated to help the families that are in need. But in addition to uh, the needs being met, you do accumulate what we call thank you, thank you. Great. Um, So if you, um, over time of the money yes, being pastor, this is Linda. Uh, support, I mean, through your church, you get what is called. You're muted. Oh, can you hear me now? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. I don't know where I left off, but um, you, um, as as funds are placed on your care portal card and you're helping families within your community, you get what we have like a, a data sheet, which is really your dashboard or your landing page uh, on our care portal website. And you'll have an accumulation of data there. So you'll see how many children you've helped within your community, uh, how much money has been filtered through your church to help families in your community, and also shows you the amount of families you have helped within your community. And this is where, to me, well, the reason why I actually even began to work with Care Portal is this can create residency. So if you're a small church or even a large church, you can then qualify for grants that are designated towards the African-American plight. So whether if you feel like, hey, we wanna create our own uh, closet and uh, a closet where we clothe um, mothers who are you know, working as best they can, they have so many children, they can't afford to buy the uh, baby clothing because he's growing, she or she's growing so fast. Through these funds, you can create grants as well create grant proposals of saying, I know what happens in my community. I am located here. This is how much money we uh, have used in the community to help families. And this is what we need. Gives you more position in grants, creating grants and applying grants to others. And so um, I hope I, I gave a good briefing of that, but to start, all you do is go on the website, click uh, uh, get involved. From there to ask for, uh, for you, yeah, that's great. So uh, you click get involved and from there it says church leaders. Uh, once you click church leaders, uh, it'll go to another screen that'll uh, have a small queue uh, there where it says get started. Once you click get started, it'll take you to our registration page. You can enroll. Um, I will say um, you have to have two people in position. Um, before you begin, and that's really what we call point person, which is the uh, person who you would likely be in contact with to help you understand how to use the portal. And then the second person would likely be the pastor or the leader of whichever organization you wish to use within your church to uh, use the care portal to help. Oh, that was okay. uh, may I thank you, uh, Tuesday? May I add that the Southern California Conference is uh, have or in discussions and dialogue with um, Tuesday at Care Portal to see if this could be a partnership or a collaboration where we can do a conference-wide program uh, using this as one of the tools. Uh, we're still doing our homework. And uh, I think I'm gonna ask her to come back to our late council in November so we can go do some specific detailed training because obviously in order, it may be a, a good idea that I may think it is, but we still need to bring it to the body and have the body um, buy into this because it does need, and we want to do this across the conference. Now, it probably makes sense to start off with a um, pilot um, and, uh, you know, my vision is maybe we can uh, get far enough on this to have a pilot in place um, after some training and some commitment. Um, the sometime within, let's say, no, uh, they, by the end of the first, on or before the end of the first quarter, 2022. Because obviously it takes a dream, it takes a team to make a dream work, and um, it takes a village to raise a child. That means that we need the, 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 we need the rest of the church with us. We need the pastors with us and we need to maybe collaborate and partner with other components within the church. You know, the, the Ray Act, the WIM, the missionaries, um, the ministerial alliance. So these are things that we need to uh, do some of um, more exploring. But I think that this is something that we definitely, as a church, should at least explore. So, oh my God. Can we ask our question? To ask to that. Yes, you can. Uh, Sister Frances uh, Settles has the next question, then followed by Dr. Verda Bradley. Thank you, Reverend Thomas. Um, my question is, are these services available in any county other than Los Angeles County? I'm in San Bernardino County. Are, are they care portal? Pardon me? Is that in regard of for care uh, portal? Yes, that's for care portal. 
Yes. Um, so we do actually have um, churches that are already participating in San Bernardino County. Um, but and I can connect you with the regional manager there. Her name is Sharon Gilmore. And um, yes, I can connect you with them. And there are churches there that are active. There are philanthropists there that are active. Um, and there are also um, activities with businesses that are located within the area who donate items to families that are in need. And is this a service where a church can adopt a family? You can. So in the process of a church dropping off the items to the family, we encourage for the church to invite those families to church to then uh, give an opportunity to help them further. Um, but let's say a family may say, you know, we, we're not interested. We, we're, we don't want to go to church or, or whatever their religious backgrounds may be. We still encourage the church to let them know if you need anything further, you can continue to reach out to us. And that is because in our care portal uh, dashboard, you have what's called church entered needs. And that is where you can actually enter in needs of members of your church, as well as members in your community. So those grandmothers who are taking care of their grandbabies, you can be an agency and enter in those needs for those grandmothers. So um, like uh, uh, Sister Jackie was saying, some of them are not technology shabby, but the church, the body there can be used to help them get those needs needed by using a digital platform. So yes. Thank you. My question, my, my question is for Tuesday. I wasn't quite understanding how churches can actually participate. Is it activities that we are asked to participate, to give with the families or are we just funneling money into por care porters? Or are you asking, you said you needed diapers, car seats. Are you asking for things like that for Pacific families? How are we connecting to these activities? I, I need a little more information because I think it sounds really good. We would like to support these families within our community and most we'll certainly invite them to church and to help support uh, the kids to keep them out of foster care. But are we, we actually working with the family or are we funneling just money? Great question. So you're actually working with the family. And so we have three tiers um, where we first equip the, the churches with the funds to help families. That's through the Care Portal card. But you also have the option to use your own church's benevolent funds if you wish to, to help families that are within close proximity. But our main goal is to eventually get a church into what we call a tier two, where the church becomes involved in the family uh, by ways of not only inviting them to church, but if the family reaches back out to the church and say, hey, you know, my daughter, you know, she needs a new pair of shoes and you helped us out before, is there any way you can help us out again? If the church, let's say, has a youth ministry there or they already have something going on in there with children, uh, you can invite that youth to come to the youth ministry to pick up those shoes or bring a youth uh, from the youth ministry department to come with you. Um, so we basically encourage to evangelize, so I say, and bring people in by the old classic way, you know, check on your neighbor. Hey, how you doing? Um, and we encourage that as well, that when you uh, deliver items to the family, you can make that second contact and just, how you doing? We just, you know, wanted to check on you. Remember you were, you know, in need of these items. Do you need anything further? So it can be as authentic and as organic as you would want it to be. But if you're looking for further support, as in maybe getting uh, trauma um, uh, um, information on how to work with families that are dealing with high rates of trauma, or how to create a foster care ministry within your church with the body that you have, we do have other networks of nonprofits that actually train churches how to work with families, how to create their own style of ministry with working with families. Um, so it, it is a broad network. So you would not be in it alone if you are like, Tuesday, we want to do something like this. You can email me or, or you can give me a call and I can direct you and connect you with someone who's actually already in the process of doing that. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> you did. Thank you. So the next question is if anyone on the panel can respond. It says, what is the role of Black fathers in raising Black children? 
Can I answer that question, please? Uh, if you don't mind, let me say this about child welfare services. You know, there's a historical basis as to why uh, child welfare services really don't try to connect well with the fathers. And if you remember years ago, if a mother was on welfare, the, the uh, worker would come and look in the house and make sure she did not have a man in the house. So child welfare actually kicked the man out of the house if the mother was in need. So that's sort of a that's sort of a a uh, rollover into the child welfare services system. So the fathers have really been denied uh, the services that they are entitled to because even the cases are named under the mother. Recently, the child welfare services did start looking at the paternal side of the family. By not looking at the paternal side of the family, they lost an opportunity to keep a child within the families. So now programs are developed, father to child, uh, uh, different programs in different communities that are dealing with the fathers. I've always felt that we could do even more because of the fact that the fathers have siblings and, and aunts and uncles who could come in and, and, and take care of a child as well. And we, we see where children have gone through the foster care system and then later on in their life, they connected with their paternal side of the family. And the paternal side of the family didn't know anything about them. So this goes back to my, my uh, request that the county should really engage in family finders, which is a program that's designed to find all relatives, both maternal and paternal. The father still has rights. Uh, the father... Uh, Rice cannot be terminated unless the father has gone through the court or they have not been able to find him after an extensive search. So fathers are still very much involved in child welfare services. They need to be. However, you know, child welfare services are overloaded system. And in actuality, they may not be putting forth the amount of effort that's needed to actually find the paternal side of families. And then there are some instances where the mother does want the paternal side of the family involved. That's not the responsibility of the child welfare service system to take the mother position. It's their responsibility to find all potential relatives for this child for the children, both paternal and maternal. I just want to add one thing going back to the uh, issues of services. There is a movement afoot to abolish child welfare services as we know it. And actually I support that issue because what COVID-19 showed us that during the COVID crisis, there was a 60% drop in referrals to child welfare services. And the family absolutely stepped in, provided, provided, I mean, the community stepped in to provide food, there was community support, and there was money given. And all of that relieved the stress that normally goes along with uh, families who are operating at poverty level. We don't have a bunch of rich people, middle-class people in foster care. We have poor. So foster care, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, is literally being built on the backs of poor and in particularly African-Americans. I want to encourage those who, I love this idea of the program that uh, Care Portal has because it goes back to my belief that have to, if you help the community to take care of the family, then the family could indeed uh, survive and thrive. So I like the idea of the Care Portal because it, it sort of goes along with the philosophy of what happened during COVID-19. But I want to re remind all of the different churches, you are a nonprofit organization. You literally can go to your office of persons in the contract and talk to them about grants or monies available to help your church keep families out of the foster care system. But you got to know your facts when you go there. You have to know about disproportionality, the number of kids in foster care, and what your community can do if the kids are coming out of your community. Get your information together and then go and demand services and and apply for grants to help you keep your families in the community. I have another question that says, um, what about uh, Care Portal Churches in Ventura County? Are there any? And what does the Strengthening Family Child Care Fund help to these families, how, how they help these families? Uh, yes, so in Ventura County, we do also have um, a representative there through um, Care Portal, so we have active churches there as well, um, as well as philanthropists. I'm not quite sure if we've had any businesses that have signed on to help the families. 
um, as far as the, the funds and how they help the families is it helps prevent uh, them from separation. So they find that in the African-American community because we are targeted um, and we are normally have the highest rates of mandated reporting that when the report begins and when the social worker steps into the home, if the social worker already have biases of what they view as a healthy home oh, or a child, child, if they come into okay. that uh, home atmosphere and see, you know what, they don't have this, they don't have that. You know, if you get these items, I will not, you know, separate the children from you. Um, but if you can get these items, then you're, you're fine. But here's a working mother. She's doing the best that she can. She may not have an extra $500 to buy an extra bed or, or another, a new refrigerator. So where Care Portal comes in is it prevents that plight of poverty where a parent is working as best as they can. They may be a working poor parent. And we say, hey, stop. You know, you cannot remove this child simply because the refrigerator is not working that well. We'll replace that refrigerator. So now this case can be closed and this family would no longer be further investigated um, by ways of them finding something. To me, I see it as a way of being targeted in ways to separate the African-American family. But um, so that's how the funds help. It helps prevent the separation. Um, and uh, when the funds are, are funneled through the card, the church benefits also in the way because now they have an economic impact. Church is already do. But I find sometimes in the African-American church, we don't keep receipts. You know, we'll just do. And we just, we're going to take care of this family. We're going to do, do, do. But we don't account the gas that it took to get there. Uh, the amount of money will cost if you were a hired person who work within an organization to provide needs for a family. Um, we sometimes don't keep the receipts of how much it costs um, and then the cost of delivering the item. So on the Care Portal platform, we automatically, it's already there. All you have to do is write that into your grant or into your petition or send it to a, a company who you're seeking a, a grant from because the, the platform is legitimate. So there is no um funny business with if the numbers are correct and and honest and the data is fantastic it's almost flawless but i won't say that <laughs> next question is is care portal available in clark county nevada nevada um i'm not quite yes. sure if it's clark county but we are we do have churches in nevada um if you were to go to our website and click uh, get connected of contacting someone. If you uh, type in your location in Nevada, they will connect you with the representative there uh, to be able to assist you in enrolling your churches and getting connected with other churches that are already involved in Care Portal. Um, I will say Care Portal have been around for now uh, since 2000, I believe in eight, but Care Portal is umbrellaed underneath what is called the Global Orphan, Orphan Project. And so it is fairly new um, as far as its introduction um, to the community, but um, we have seen uh, so far we've, we've serviced 100,000 children uh, at the end of, I believe it was July. So um, it's growing and uh, we're new, but we're all technology based. And I just believe God is doing something new with the technology and the, the digital divide. Yeah, uh, Sister Bevlin has a question followed by Sister Barnett. Well, actually, I, I had a statement, so I've already answered. I've already made my statement, so I'm going to take my hand down. And please let Ms. Barnett go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I'm just wondering, in listening to the, everything and everybody and the resources, is there some serious advocacy going on in the either the state legislature or federal? Okay, the governor, what, a couple of years ago, they set aside millions of dollars for caregivers, family caregivers. And it seems like there's a big disproportion of how much a kin can get for foster care and a total stranger can get so much more. So how about some advocacy? That is his... That is historical. There was a belief that kids should not get the same amount of money as foster care. That was that's historical, and you're absolutely correct. Mill, the uh, Miller Yoakum rule at the time allowed for the kids to actually apply for the same rate of monies. 
and there was a change that allowed the kin to get the same as equivalent of a non non relative to get the dollars amount. Here's the issue with it. Uh, if it isn't automatic, and I need to follow up to find out if it isn't automatic, and the, and the social worker doesn't automatically set that relative caregiver up in that program, then it might not happen. So what? This is where the education piece comes in. This is why I'm saying, you know, get educated about what's going on out there and find out from your community, from your county. So how many of our relatives are receiving the dollars equivalent to a non-relative caregiver? And if you see that disparate uh, results, do something about it. Say, well, we don't think that's fair. They have a right, because a lot of what I'm saying to you, most of the family comes from poverty level. So to put two and three children in with the relatives who doesn't have any money, I just had a situation in San Diego, the uh, relative was receiving unemployment. And I had to call to intervene and say, why aren't you giving her money? You put two kids in her care. She has to work. She has to pay for child care. How do you think this is going to happen? So if you don't uh, advocate for it, a lot of, to be honest, you won't get it. Okay. And I think that's based on attitudinal biases. But educate your community. If you know some parents who are in it, ask them to do that. Or if you know some relative that's caring for children in foster care, ask them for it. Ask them if they're getting it. And if they aren't, then get a group to advocate for them. Because it's a monster system to advocate. Yes. And uh, just to piggyback off of what uh, Ms. Patrice is saying, it it is very true. In, in these meetings, I've been to DC and I've advocated for minority families to, for their bill to be passed, for minority families to not be so closely examined, so monitored. Uh, but instead of separating the families of doing services with inside the homes, unfortunately, this bill did not pass. It was bipartisan. There were lots of people on it, but I was not invited. I had to invite myself. So I find that you have to bombard, like how we bombard heaven, we got to bombard the, 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 the house. And so um, I think when you associate with other associations who are involved, if anyone is interested, FFTA is one. They were actually were the ones who created this bill. It was originally designated for the Caucasian population, but when I got a drift of the bill, I said, well, this will be great for the African-American plight, be it that we are high rates of going into foster care. So I find that you have to either join others or create your own. Um, I find churches to be not only uh, great in population, but they have great positions when they get behind bills and create them and then demand for their local representatives to put this on the floor. So I, I will say that is a great point and advocacy is greatly needed. There's very few people who speak of these topics in DC. Um, and even when it comes to city council, it, it's highly ignored, but it supplies so much to the systems that are in place. It supplies the prison system. It supplies the foster care system. It supplies the policing. It, it supplies so much. And it's something that people tend to um, ignore or are just unaware of. So conversations like this, meetings like this, gets the word out and gets people equipped and ready. And I, I hope this continues. This next question is for uh, Sister Broxton. It says, how many uh, persons have been, have benefited from this organization, from your organization? And is there a list of visitors? And then besides the paintings, are there sculptures on display and how can we help? Um. There are no sculptures on display right now. We have not had any donations of sculptures. Um, we have probably had, we technically we're not open because of COVID, but we are doing things like we did our scholarship ceremony in July where we award a scholarship to youth. And then every year in August, uh, we do a donor appreciation event that's on Biddy Mason's birthday. So we've had visitors in that respect, but both of those events were held outdoors. Um, in terms of, so there hasn't been a tremendous amount of traffic to the house, but I would encourage those of you who are local to give us a call if you'd like to come and see the house. We'd be more than, we'd like to show off. So we have no problems in having you come and see it. Um, but the youth that have been here actually were responsible for us starting a program called The Exchange that happens on the second Sunday of every month from one to five where, where the uh, youth can come in, have a, a typical Sunday dinner, 
and then also be able to just have a safe place to hang out, uh, to play board games. Uh, they're preparing a list of speakers that they want uh, us to get to come and talk to them. So this is very much a youth driven event. Uh, once with the, the veil of COVID totally lifts, then we'll be open six days a week. And I wanted to also mention, we have one room that's set aside in the house for family reunification visits because we're working with DCFS so that uh, these families that are trying to reunite don't have to meet at the park, don't have to meet at McDonald's. They can meet in a place that's safe, warm and welcoming and hopefully help them mend, them mend themselves and get their kids back. I think that's all the questions that we have. Okay, well, thank you. I was going to ask you how many are, or how much time are we allowed on the Q&A, but I'm glad that we were uh, able to answer all the questions, but I'm, pretty certain that um, if there's any other follow-up information um, or questions um, to, to any of these uh, presenters, if you uh, make sure you send it to us, uh, Southern California Conference, we'll make sure we connect you guys because what this is, is connecting opportunities to develop ministry work. And I think I said at our executive board meeting that our, con our, our theme for this com conference here is the work of ministry grows the lay by growing the church. And we can only do that by ministry beyond the walls of the church and to minister to the community. We cannot grow the lay nor the church by staying within the walls of the church. So um, that concludes me talking too much, but uh, I think the next thing on our agenda is um, offering in prayer and we'll bring up our treasurer, uh, Judith Malone. Good afternoon, everyone. It's offering time. I'd like to say hello to the lay and to everyone that's on this Zoom call today. We have already received an offerings from our pastors. However, if the pastors would like to continue to give, we will be happy to accept. You may mail your offerings to the Southern California Lay Organization. Attention, Kathy Green. Her mailing address is 3011 West 90th Street, Inglewood, California, 90305. You may also give on givelify.com. Click on the Givelify, go to Southern California Annual Conference and follow the prompts. And you may also give on Southern California Giving. Also, go to the site and follow the prompts. Now let's go to the throne in prayer. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your blessings that you bestowed upon all of us. Father, I pray for our lay witness congregation today. Lord, may we all give with gladness and sincerity. Father, no one ever gives a present to someone with, with uh, reluctance. And we should never give you what already belongs to you with reluctance either. And so Lord, without hesitation, we gladly give to you what is yours. Bless these cheerful givers and bless this offering this day. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister God Judith. No matter how you try. Okay. I think, I don't know if we have a uh, Reverend um, uh, uh, Williamson on the line. They said he might be. If he's here, um, let us know that. Otherwise, we will um, go into closing remarks. I think I've said some of my closing remarks early. So what I'd like to do at this point is bring um, the, our uh, fifth district lay president, Lamar Rose, to share some closing remarks before we um, do the lay benediction and close. Good evening. Thank you, President Smith, for just a wonderful, wonderful, I want to say program for just wonderful bringing awareness and attention to us all. I think it was, um, yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, meeting with the committee and, you know, we talked about the thing soaring, keeping, you know, and, you know, one of my guidance or just, uh, I guess, opinion or suggestion was, you know, having enthusiastic, being passionate about it. And I see the passion that the committee has drawn to this subject. And I think one of the things I put in in, in the chat was about the, da the data, and it was very alarming to me. I think of overarching, I think we all have seen or probably have some, some degree of awareness. Um, maybe it, it impacted some of our family, maybe it impacted some of us personally, but um, really the core what here, what, what I saw, and I'm thankful for, again, this committee bringing it to the attention and thoroughly thank you for the panelists. I can see the passion, your commitment um, that you have sown into this. Um, Sister you know, Jackie Broxton, in terms of the building at home and, that, uh, and the paintings and everything. So as you can see the time and labor that you have put into it, just the panelists in general. You know, also for me, it was kind of a self-conviction because, you know, as a father, you know, I'm just think thinking of every day when I wake up and I look in the eyes of my daughter and I, you know, I take her off to school, give her breakfast and all those different things. But I see the pure and the innocent that, that I, you know, that I share with her. And just to think about there are a multitude of other young men and women, young ladies and young men that are not receiving that same care. So that conviction to me is say, what can I do to touch beyond my own home? What can we all do to touch beyond our individual home? I know we talked a lot about the church and we are the church. You know, in, in this, you know, my thing, my self-conviction is what can Lamar do? Not relying on my church, not relying on just the organization, but what can I do? And then when, if we take that just self, and then plant ourselves into it. And, that, and then that's how we grow beyond just individual. And it also, you know, we talked about the data and being educated and being informed. But really the, the purest thing is God is telling us to be disciples and go out, go out and help. Go out and help people. Feed, clothe, go out and help. So I, you know, my pledge to from a personal and also to President Smith from a district perspective, let's help. How can we all build and merge this together? Okay. How can we all bridge this and get behind, you know, the care portal? How can we, you know, again, you know, I just seen a lot of the conversation where I can say for myself, what can I do as a father? I think Brother Bill and the, you know, what can the what can the black man do to help young men and also young young ladies? It's alarming to think about how these young ladies are being trafficked and being objects to and preyed on. It's it's alarming. It's scary and it's sad. So I'm just so full and thankful for this discussion. 
because again, it brings awareness and it brings attention. And then I say to us, we can't stop and just hearing all this in this last hour and a half. Right. It would be shame on us if we turn off the Zoom call and we go back to business as usual. <laughs> you know, it would be shame on us if we don't continue to reach out to these panelists and say, what can I do? And then we start the conversation, what can others, you know, in my sorority, in my fraternity, you know, uh, in my home, what can we do to connect with the church, connect with the portal? What can we do to make sure every night that we sleep, that we can understand that we have done something to save someone's life or help them um, make it out of poverty, to help them get educated, to help them now become the future leaders, to help them sit in the seats that we may be sitting. So I thank you, President Smith. I thank you to your committee. I thank you to okay. this panelists for, for challenging us with the data. We can no longer say, I, I didn't know. If you're on this call, you're on this line, you now know. So we can't keep a blind eye. So thank you, uh, Southern California Conference, for bringing this to our attention. And I pledge as a district president, or even us just as Lamar, to support this, to get behind it, and I will be going out to the website to join in and roll. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Rose. Um, and uh, like I said, it takes a team to make a dream work. And so we need to pull this whole team together throughout the whole fifth district. And quite frankly, the entire church, but we got to start somewhere first. So thank you so much. I don't believe we have any other comments. I know our Bishop was uh, scheduled to be uh, at the, uh, the end, the last uh, closing remarks, but I think he made his remarks already. So unless our, our IT manager, um, Reverend uh, Benjamin Thomas knows otherwise, um, we can then move forward with the late benediction and closing. Yes, we'll go ahead and play the late benediction. Okay.